collection of classes and objects, we're going to spend um, some time talking about what really goes on uh, when we create a variable, how variables are actually stored, and what's the difference between when we store a variable for primitive and we store a variable for uh, an object reference. It's important to know this. This has implications sort of across the board. So it's really important that we have uh, an understanding of it. Um, without understanding it, a lot of stuff that's going to happen might seem mysterious, all right? And you, and you might not really, uh, you know, follow exactly why certain things happen the way they do. But that's why we're going to take the time to understand it. First of all, let's talk about just plain old simple variables. If I have in code, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to write a full Java program here. I'm just going to write some snippets of code. Um, but if I have in code something like this, let's let's analyze and see what happens. If I declare an integer, i, let's say. What does that actually do? All right, that actually sets aside some memory in the computer's memory. All right, that the program knows by the name of i, but in the computer memory has an address associated with it. Now we're not going to get down into binary and all that stuff, but uh, we can say. You know, we, we can, you know, conceptually go over what's going on here. So let's say this is location 100. Let's say this has an address of 100. And then if I say something, i equals 5, the binary representation of 5 is put into that memory location. All right? That's sort of variables 101, right? Um, it corresponds to, you know, the idea is, is that when we, when we define a variable and when we assign it a value, we're manipulating addresses in memory. We're manipulating locations in memory and we're giving them values. And then we can retrieve them later. And it would be hard if we had to keep track of like memory where things are, so we give them variable names. The, the, the higher level programming languages, higher level than machine language, allow us to give variable names so that we can just say, hey, I want I instead of having to figure out I want this memory location. All right, if I do something like this then, int j, I create another variable, all right, my, which my program will know is j, which will correspond to some other address. I don't know what it is, but we'll make something up, 120. And then if I say j equals i, what I'm doing is I'm copying the contents of memory location 100 into memory location 120. All right? So now j has a value of 5. All right? If I then go i equals 2, what am I doing? Well, I'm taking the value of 2 and I'm copying it in the memory location having an address of 100. So when I'm done with this, i has a value of 2 and j has a value of 5. I hope that's all pretty well reviewed for you. Maybe, you. maybe it's been a while since you talked about it in these terms of addresses and memory locations, but that's really what's going on when we have a primitive. All right? Now, we'll keep this off to the side and we'll start looking at what happens when we create objects and object references. Okay? Objects, as we know, um, aren't simple entities like primitives are. Primitives really are very simple structures. There's an integer. And what's an integer? It's an integer. <laughs> All right. What's a Boolean? It's a single value that, that translates to true or false. What's a date? Well, it's a date. It's really just single part sort of things, you know, that, that really don't exhibit complex behavior and, and, and don't have multiple values. You know, there's just a value. They're very simple. They're sort of the building blocks uh, of, of the language. And, and they're called primitives because they're simple and they're handled that way. 
therefore, I know how much memory is going to be allocated for each one. For example, and, and I, I don't know the, the exact numbers, but someone knows the numbers, right? Someone knows that an integer is X number of bytes long. Every single int will be X bytes long, right? Every single double will be Y bytes long. Every single Boolean will be Z bytes long, and so on. Can we say that about an object? No, because an object has a lot of stuff in it. A lot, an object has uh, properties, it has methods, it has all sorts of things. All right. So some objects may be smaller than others. Right? Um, if we had an object that contained um, a list of 50,000 names, that would be bigger in terms of taking up more memory than an object that stored a list of five names. All right. So, how do we handle objects then? Objects are handled in a different manner. Objects are handle, handled in sort of a two-step process. All right. Let's go and let's talk about our picture object from last time, or our picture class. My God, I broke the pen. There we go. <laughs> Picture P. Then I broke this down into two lines and I'll do it again now even though we can combine it into two. P equals new picture. Picture P, what that does is that sets up very similar to what the primitives a memory location, maybe location 200, let's say, that's going to contain something eventually. All right? But it's not going to contain the whole object. It's not going to contain everything about the object. It's going to contain a pointer to where that object lives. Okay? And the object lives someplace called the heap. If you think about it, it sort of makes sense, right? Because with primitive variables, again, we know what, what size they're going to be. So we can allocate, when you create the variable, you can allocate the side, uh, size. The, the objects that we create, we have no idea how big they're going to be. So what we have is we have a pointer to where it's eventually going to live uh, on the heap. Initially, though, that pointer doesn't point to anything, right? If we simply create this, all we've said is, I have a, a position in memory that I can store an object of type picture. All right? So it doesn't point to anything. Eventually it will point to the heap. And it will point to a specific memory location in the heap. All right? Which is a section of memory devoted for handling these things. Yes? But that 200 memory location, that is the, that's the location of memory that's going to hold the reference to. It's going to hold the reference to. The, the object, correct. So that 200 is where that reference is going to be. So that would still be created. That would be created at that point, correct. All right. So now I say P equals new picture. What happens? Space is allocated for this on the heap. I'm going to quit playing with the cap here before I hurt someone. All right. Space is allocated on the heap for our object P. And let's say the address of where it's located is position 1000 on the heap. What gets stuffed in the variable P then is the pointer to that memory location of 1000. Okay? So, this variable P contains a pointer to the memory location where this is. So variable P might be in memory location 200 or whatever, and it contains a pointer to this location in the memory where the actual data associated with the object lives. All right? So it's a little, little less direct, right? In this case, the value, because it's just a simple thing, it's a primitive, all right? 
is stored in the memory location by the value. Here, a pointer to the value, to the values or the attributes or whatever you want to put it, uh, of the object is stored in the variable. Now, where's the implication of that? <clears throat> if I were to say, picture Q, Q equals P, let's see what happens. All right. Picture Q is going to create in memory someplace a variable that is going to point eventually to a picture object. All right. So again, it creates the variable, it creates the object reference, but that object reference doesn't point to anything. At this point, it's called a null object reference because it doesn't point to a real object. It's a null object. I can almost guarantee, you know, put my uh, mind reader or, or, or uh, uh, um, you know, uh, psychic hat on, I can almost guarantee every one of you will get a null object reference error at some point throughout the term. What does that mean? That means that you refer to a variable that doesn't point to anything. So it doesn't know what to do. It doesn't point to a picture, doesn't point to anything. And therefore, it blows up and you get an error. So, that's what happens when we create the variable. We've simply set aside a location that doesn't point to anything. When I say Q equals P, what do you think happens? Pretty much the same thing happens that happens here, right? The contents of the memory location name P get copied into the contents of memory location named by Q. So what is the contents of memory location P? It's 1000. And that points to this object. So we'll copy the contents of that, which is a memory location and not a value, into that variable. Now both of these variables point to the same object. All right, and that in a nutshell is the difference between the two. In this example with primitives, we have two integers and we will always have two integers. All right, because we can assign their values back and forth. We can set i equal to j and j equal to i or whatever. We're copying the contents of those variables, which is the actual value. All right, so I can copy the value from i into j, and then change the value of i, that doesn't change the value in j. Alright, because they each have their own distinct value. In this case though, when I copy the um, contents of the variable p into the variable q, I'm not copying, quote, the values of it. I'm copying uh, the pointer. You know, because really the value of the variable is the pointer, not the, what you would think of as the values of that object. So therefore, P and Q point to the same object. So in this case, there is only one picture object, and both variables reference that. So, I could say P set volume 47, you know, make a 47 ounce picture. If I did system dot 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 print whatever that is q dot get volume I'd get 47. All right, it would it would output 47 because it's pointing to the same object. Now that's the way it works. The only time an object is created is when you see the word new. All right. That's what creates an object. This simply declares the pointers, and this simply copies the pointers. The only object created is new. All right? So, new creates an object. What destroys an object? Right? Because we have this memory that we don't want to stay uh, being used forever. Right? We want to free that memory up. We don't want the memory just to keep expanding and, and getting more stuff put into it. 
when nothing refers to an object anymore, then that object eventually will be cleared out of memory. I say eventually because that is uh, the precise moment that happens is up to the Java virtual machine. That's called garbage collection. All right. But if you think about it, if I don't have anything pointing to that object, you know, it's dead to me anyhow. Right? I can't reference it. I can't do anything with it. So therefore, it's useless to me, and eventually it will get cleared out. All right. Let's go, let's play around with this a little bit of creating some objects and copying them and doing some things and, and, and so we get a, a better sense of object behavior. All right, let's start with the example we had last time. I'll get rid of the classes. And our picture class, I'm going to open up. We probably won't make really a lot of changes to this. We can, we can demonstrate what we need to just with the methods that we have here. Um, but we'll go in and we'll go into this one. And I'll, I'll make a whole new test class to test these sort of things. First of all, I'm going to do this. All right, picture P. And at each point, we, sh we should explain what's going on. All right, we, we should understand what's going on. So if I say this, P dot set volume in ounces, What's going to happen? Okay. Well, let, let, let's follow this through using the chart. All right. I have these two commands. This pen is jinxed. All right. I say picture P. That's a lowercase p. And then I say p dot set volume in ounces 32. All right, first line of code, what does that do? That creates a storage location, a memory location somewhere in memory that's called p. And there's a numerical address associated with it. We don't know what that is. We don't really care. We can say it's 100, but it doesn't really matter. But it doesn't point to anything, all right? Because we haven't created an object yet, all right? Here's our heap. We then go and say p set volume in ounces 32. What we're going to try to do is take that 32 and set it in the attribute for this object. Well, this doesn't point to an object. Therefore, we're going to get an error. All right, because this, will, this is a classic null object reference. In fact, we should get the error at compile time because the compiler is smart enough to know, hey, I'd, whoops. The compiler is smart enough to know, hey, I declared the variable here. I'm trying to use attributes of that object when I haven't created an object. So it's smart enough to know, hey, that's not allowed. So sure enough, if I go in here and save this, and let's try compiling it. If I say Java C, I don't know what's that called? Picture test class. thinking about it. All right. It's smart enough to know that that variable might not have been initialized. Well, actually, obviously, it hasn't been initialized because we've never created that. 
All right. So again, the new is the only thing that creates it. Uh, an instance of the class. It's the only thing that creates an object. So we have to create an object before we can reference any properties of it. So that's why we get an error on that. So what's the solution? The solution, we can put it on two different lines or we can combine it on one line and say equals new picture. And now if we do that, we'll be okay. And I'll compile it just to show you that takes care of that error. All right. Now, once you've set up an object, I said it gets killed or it gets clobbered or however you want to put it um, when nothing points to it anymore. All right. Let's see if we can figure out how to clear out that object, how to kill the object that's in P. What if we do this? Actually, let's move, let's move these around. Let's put this up here. All right. What do you suppose is going to happen? Let, let's, let's play computer and see what's going to happen. Picture Q, or I'm sorry, picture P equals new picture. What are we doing? We declare a memory space called P that points to a new object in the heap. So P points to something in the heap now because we said picture P equals new picture. All right? So P points to something in the heap where this object lives and all the attributes are, are stored. All right? I then declare picture Q and it gets stored somewhere in memory, but it doesn't point to anything because I didn't say Q equals new picture. It's an empty or a null reference. If I say P equals Q, I take the value of the P, or of the, I'm sorry, of the Q variable and stuff it in the value of the P variable. Well, there's no reference in the Q variable, so therefore P gets wiped out and P is also a null reference. So therefore, when I go to compile this, I'll bet you I get an error on this line saying, hey, Q's null. And Q might not have been initialized, therefore, this is a, a bad, risky statement to do. So let's see. Make sure I've saved it. And sure enough, it tells me, hey, Q might not have been defined because it, it knows that. All right. Yeah, that's actually what I'm going to get to now. Let's, 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 uh, let's do this though. P equals new picture. Q uh, equals new picture, let's say. P equals Q. Q equals null. And then finally, P equals set volume in ounces. Let's is that going to work? Will this give me an error or will this work? Let's, let's think this through. Pardon me? It should work. Why? We have P that creates a new picture object. So P, let's say, points to memory location. Uh, P uh, points to an object in the heap, let's say, in, in position 100. Q points to position 200, uh, another picture object in the heap. So at this point, there are two picture objects. All right. P points to, say, the one in 100. Q points to the one, say, in 200. I then say P equals Q. So let's, let's follow this through. How can I do this? 
I'll, I'll, write, I'll write the instructions here and we'll, we'll follow through. And we'll keep track of how many objects we have at each point. And again, I'll do some shorthand here. All right. So here's our heap. Pitcher P equals new pitcher. That declares a variable P and points somewhere on the heap. For now, uh, from now on, I will dismiss writing the numbers, all right? Because, um, you know, I'm, I'm just making up the numbers anyhow. That's kind of arbitrary. So P will point to... this object here on the heap. All right. I then say Q equals new picture. So Q will point to this object in the heap. So at this point, I have two picture objects. One that's pointed to by P, one that's pointed to by Q. Now you could know that even without tracing the code because if you look at this, you say there's two news. Right? Two news means two objects. All right. Now I say P equals Q. What does that mean? That means P is no longer going to point to this object. So this is gone. P instead will also point to this object. So I have two object reference variables both pointing to the same object. So P and Q both point to the same object. What happens to this object? It's dead, all right? It will be garbage collected through the Java virtual machine. But nothing is pointing to it, right? So even if, uh, you know, so, so Java is free to get rid of it because we can't access anything in it anyhow because nothing points to it anymore, all right? So this object at this point, the original one, is dead. We then say Q equals null. Now what does that do? Well, that doesn't wipe out this object. That wipes out this object reference. So therefore, that Q no longer points to this object. Q doesn't point anywhere. All right? But I can still say p.setValume32, and that's fine. And it will set the value of this object to 32. Yes? Once, once nothing references an object, it's gone. Correct. No. No. Because how could you point to it? You, you, yeah, you, you, you need... No, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying it in, in, in an accusing way. Well, how can you... No, no, you, you can't point to it. It's gone. You have no reference to it. So, so yeah, it, it's gone to you. Um, what if you save that memory? Um, then you have a reference. Right. Then, then how would you save it? How do you save something that points to an object? Through an object reference. So you'd have to declare a variable P of type picture or some type um, related to picture up in the uh, uh, object structure of it. You know, you could store it as an object or whatever. Correct it would have to be an object reference, right, to point to the heap. Question? If there's no object references to an object, it's going to destroy it. So, yeah, the only way that you could keep that available is to have an object reference point it, pointing to it. It's lost in space, right? It's gone. Nothing, nothing points to it, so it might as well be gone. So like the question you're asking, saving it as an integer, well, you, the way you save object reference pointers is through an object reference. So if you really want to keep that around, you then create an object reference to it. All right. Yes? Uh, 
Um, we can try. Uh, I think it will tell us that it's an object. I think that's all it will say. Um, let's try that. One of two things is going to happen. It's either going to work or not. Do you like how confident I was when I said that? It will either give me a compile error and say, no, you're not allowed to do that, or it will simply say that it's an object. Um, let's go in, save this, try to compile it. All right. Telling us it's a picture, and maybe that is the pointer to somewhere. Doesn't particularly do you any good, right? But uh, again, you know, that may give you a sense a little bit of, I would assume that that last part of that's an address. So if we did, well, let's, well, let's have some more fun. Let's get rid of this. Let's do this. Because if what I'm saying is right, yeah, it says the same thing for both, right? It's telling us both of them are pictures and they're at that location. Let's remove this line so that we're back to having two objects <coughs> and compile it, and I'll bet you those numbers are different. And sure enough, they are, right? Because they now point to different things. Yes? Yes? Well, that's a good question. I'm guessing it would it would um, it would blow up. Let's try this. Let's try Q, and we won't say equals new. Yeah, we we can't address it because it doesn't know what to make of it. All right. Okay, the question always comes to, you know, why are we even doing this, <laughs> right? We're doing this to understand how it works. You're not going to write a code that's going to take P and assign it to Q, Q to assign it to back to Z, and, and so on and so forth. We're doing it to understand <clears throat> what happens because what we will do will be something like this. We'll create an object somewhere. We may call another method on a different object and pass that object to it. All right. For example, let's say we had a, with our picture, in addition to our picture, let's say we had a dinner table class. All right. And a dinner table has a picture on it. Right. You go to a dinner, you know, a catering company, there's a picture on there. I could have a class of dinner table And, whoops, one of its attributes might be a picture, a picture object. And I might have a, on this uh, class a set picture method that's going to accept as an argument a picture. And that, yeah, is, is part of the class dinner table. And I could somewhere create a picture object, call in that object. It's important for us to realize that even though there are two things pointing to it, it's still just the one object. All right. So yeah, the code I'm writing now is just to demonstrate the way it behaves um, so that when we do things like that, we're understanding what's going on. Yes? You, you want to actually, you want to make a copy of the object as opposed to making two references to the same. There are ways to copy an object through methods 
Um, again, I don't believe that, that you can do exactly what, you can achieve the same outcome, but I don't believe it's through the same method in Java. All right. But yeah, that's a great question, you know. Uh, really, the, the purpose of this is to sort of understand what's going on and understand the life cycle uh, of, of these classes and objects. All right. Exactly, exactly. And when I make my mistakes on purpose, of course, then you'll understand them. All right, so let's go and let's sort of get back to what I was saying just to prove the point. Exactly. Get. All right. So let's let's look at this and let's see what this is going to display. All right. I I define my two objects, P and Q. They both point to different objects. I then when I say P equals Q, I point P to the same object that Q points to. I say P set ounces to 32. I then output Q's get volume in ounces, uh, the result of that function. I should get 32, right? Because, because they both point to the same object. All right? Let's, let's look at this one again, because I, I saw a couple people shaking their heads. Let's review this. So, P equals, picture P equals new picture. Picture Q equals new picture. And I'm going to use my fictional numbers because I think that's better than crossing out lines I just decided between the two examples. I then say P equals Q. I then say P dot set volume in ounces 32. I then say system dot print out LN Q dot get volume in ounces. So, I execute this statement. What does that do? That creates a variable called P that's going to be an object reference pointer. All right, to somewhere on the heap. So, somewhere on the heap. And since I say new, it actually goes and creates that object. And whatever, wherever I store it on the heap gets stored in P. So let's say P gets a value of position 100 in the heap, address of 100. I do the same thing for Q. Q is going to store a picture reference. I say new picture that's going to create on the heap. Another picture object, let's say this in position 200 or address 200. So now I have my two objects uh, on the heap, position 100 and 200. P's pointing to one of them, Q's pointing to the other. I then say P equals Q. What does that do? That changes, that copies the value of Q, which is this pointer, which is this address, into P. So P now has a value of 200 in it. So both of these point to location 200. So that's the same object that they point to. The object that was in the heap in position 100 is now gone. All right. Uh, there's no references to it, and garbage cleaning will clean it um, some point shortly after that happens. So this is gone. Can't reference it. Forget about it. We then say P set volume in ounces. What we do then is we're going to call that method on this object. The object is in 200. And we're going to store somewhere in that object the value of 32. We then in the next line say I want to print out Q get volume in ounces. Well, that's point of the same object. When it does the get method, it's point of that same attribute. And so we're just going to output 32. So let's make sure 
that indeed is what I think happens. All right, and sure enough, it is. All right. Now, let's try to get tricky here. And I'm going to say Q equals null. And P equals null. Or P equals Q, let's say. What I'm doing, what I'm attempting to do, is to put enough steps in there to trick the compiler into not realizing that maybe uh, there's a null object reference. So I don't get a compile error. If you notice, in the first few examples, I declared the variable, then I tried to access some object without creating the object. So the compiler is clever enough to say, hey, you just created it in that line. You can't start accessing it here because you didn't create it. Here I'm trying to put enough steps in there to confuse it. Let's see if I was able to do that. I was, all right? The reason I do that is to demonstrate this, you know? I'm not getting one past it because if I go and run this, I get an exception thread and it is the classic null uh, pointer exception, all right? The reason for that, again, P points to an object on the heap in position 100. P points to an object on the heap in position 200. Now P equals Q, so I copy that 200 from Q into P. So now they both point to the object in position 200. The object in position 100 is dead. It disappears. I say Q equals null. So that object in Heap location 200 is still there, right? Because Q points to nothing, but P still points to position 200. So at this point, this is where we had a couple examples ago. At this point, P is still pointing to the object that's on the heap in position 200. Well, when I say P equals Q, I copy the null from Q into P, so now Neither P nor Q points to anything, all right? Both the objects that I've created are gone. They both disappeared and none of them point to anything. So when I try to execute this statement, I get a, a null object exception. Now, if you notice, this is a different kind of error, right? This is a runtime error versus a compile error. Compile errors are good, relatively speaking, right? Because the compiler is telling you, hey, you did something that just flat out doesn't make sense and, and isn't a good idea, and you then can go and correct it. Runtime errors are the most are the more insidious ones, right? Because they typically only show up situationally, right? I mean, in this one, obviously, I, I contrived a situation to get a runtime error. But if you can imagine, you know, where lines of code where you're passing object references back and forth. You know, you're going to be doing this accidentally sometime. You know, you're going to null out something without realizing you're affecting something else. Then you're going to go and try to do something and you'll get that error. So these are typically the harder sort of errors to catch, all right? Because the compiler will tell you, hey, then your program just doesn't run. You got to fix it. With runtime errors, typically it's some sort of situational thing that causes something not to point to something and there's no way the compile could have known it, right? We, we were, we kind of tricked it into not realizing that we were doing a bad situation here, all right? We'll talk more about these sort of errors when we get into uh, exception processing, all right? And, and, and writing code to, to test for these sort of things and, and, and handling them gracefully instead of just blowing up, all right? Um, by the way, this is this is a way. Uh, again, you know, um, you know, if you look at at hackers and things like that, there, there's ways that they can exploit these sort of things. 
uh, these sort of issues. You know, um, that's not really my area of expertise, but um, on web pages, for example, is what they call a SQL injection attack, where you insert a SQL statement in a form field and try to run it and see what happens. And then sometimes you get information to exploit and so on. But at any rate, um, that's, that's, again, what is meant by the null pointer error. That means that you're, you're, trying, to access, you're trying to access an object that the, and there's no object on the other end. And you're using an object reference. Questions about this? All right. Where we're going to get to, all right, um, looking at the time, this, this, write this date down on the calendar because this might be uh, a day that I'm going to end early, all right, by a couple minutes. I always believe in giving you more than you pay for, so I usually go a couple minutes over. Where we'll get to next time, I believe, I'll have to double check my notes, but is start using um, object references in function calls as arguments and as return values. Uh, and start talking about how different objects can uh, collaborate together and how, how different objects connect together. Because they can connect in, in a couple different ways. One example I gave is, um, you know, there is, there is what's sometimes called a collaboration. In other words, a, a, a table can have a picture right, on it, if you're doing a catering business. You might want to keep track of the tables and the pictures are on the tables. Uh, another example is uh, what's called composition. For example, an automobile, uh, if, if you can imagine us writing a, a, a class for an automobile, some of the attributes for an automobile may themselves be objects. So an automobile might have, as one of its instance variables, a transmission object might have a steering object, that might have four wheel objects, and so on down the line. And we need to know how to, and we need to be aware of that and, and start going and, and creating them and passing them back and forth. That's why this is so important to do at this point. As we get into that, it's important for us to understand how these pointers work and what really happens when you assign one object pointer to another and what really happens when you say a new and so on. This is, by the way, why we have to say new for an object and we don't have to say new for um, other variables, uh, for, for, uh, for primitives. Uh, because, again, the primitives being simple, you know, when you create it and you assign a value, boom, it puts the value here. Whereas in an object, you can create the pointer and you might not necessarily want to create a new object. You might just want to create a new pointer. So the language allows you the flexibility to create a pointer that doesn't point to anything and, oh yeah, later on filling in what, what it's going to point to. All right. We'll see you over in lab. Yes? Um, when I was working on the lab mm -hmm. with the triangle, mm -hmm. and it said you wanted an array of triangles. Yes. I was wondering if you were going to cover how to... Okay, um, an array of triangles, let's see. Let's say if we want to make an array of pictures. Let, let's go and do that since I have a picture object. Um, let's go to my test class. Trying to see how to create.
let's go in here and say picture P equals new picture three. Okay. That will create a array of three pictures. Pardon me? Well no 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 no. Um, let me explain what I mean because I can see where you'd be confused. It creates an array that contains three uh, uh, picture pointers. That doesn't mean that those picture pointers point to anything. So right now what we have is an array where P sub 0, P sub 1, and P sub 2 point to nada, to nothing. All right. So, maybe this is what you mean by saying you had to use two news. What we have to do now is create our instances of that, that, those, those pictures. So, what I'd have to do is I'd have to do this and say for int i equals zero, i less than p dot length. I plus plus P sub I equals new picture. All right. Because then what that does is then that goes in and loops through this array and each iteration through the loop will create a new one of these that will point to some memory location. So in that respect, yes, you have to use two news. One, to say I'm creating my new array object, all right, my array object is going to contain three picture pointers. So that's what this does. That creates the new pitch, oh, I'm sorry, the new array object that contains three positions for pitcher pointers. This loop then goes and initializes those three pitcher objects. You can only you, you can only put in. We haven't talked about inheritance yet. But if I declare a, um, a an object, um, if I declare an object pointer to be a certain type, I can only put in one of its types um, or a um, ancestor of it. So, for example, I'm not sure if we talk about inheritance next week or what, but if I had, let's say, for geometric um, shapes, let's say I have a quadrilateral class and I have a triangle class. All right. And then from quadrilateral, I have rectangle. And from rectangle, I have square. We'll talk about exactly what inheritance means, but essentially, I think we've all had some exposure with that. Uh, if not, you know, we'll cover it next week. Um, they're, they're like related things. They're like specialized cases of it. In other words, a square is really a specialized case of a rectangle, right? A square is a rectangle where instead of only each pair being equal, all four sides are equal. And a quadrilateral uh, uh, or a rectangle is a special case of a quadrilateral and, and so on. And so if I say this, quad Q, 
I could say quad Q equals new quad. All right, and that's legit, right? I could say quad Z equals new square. And that would work because a square is a quadrilateral. So I can say that. I could not say quad W equals new triangle because a triangle is unrelated to the quadrilaterals. All right, it's not part of that family, it's not part of that chain of descendants and sub and superclasses and all that. Yes, yes. Um, and again, we'll talk about this uh, next time, but inheritance is an example of an is a relationship, where I say that a square is a rectangle, a rectangle is a quadrilateral. So therefore, it's legit to say this quadrilateral is a square, because a square is a kind of quadrilateral. I can't, however, say a triangle is a quadrilateral, because, you know, that, that doesn't, you know, that's not true. It's not a true statement. So uh, again, I'm not sure if it's literally next time or not, but sometime in the very future we'll talk about inheritance and subclasses and all that. So yes, you can do it in that manner. So it's not always going to be, you know, class C equals new class. It could be class C equals new subclass, where subclass and class are, are related. All right. I'm going to make sure this compiles, by the way. <laughs> Hoping not to have stirred you wrong. Yeah, it does. Okay.